Hi everybody, my name is Bianca Movius Clune, Director of the Soil Health Division. Starting us live here, really excited to have you all on. So far we've got over 200 participants already. I know that over 400 people accepted the invite and it kept going further. So we actually made this into a live event, a different feature in Teams than what we had before. Um, but here we are, really excited to have you all on. We'll wait for just another minute or so and then we will get us going. All right, I think I'm going to get us all started. I want to welcome you all. Um, this is the first in a series of conversations of, on soil health. Uh, we're hoping to make this a series of uh, conversations where we can really get everybody involved. Um, the series is intended to help our field area and state staff gain ideas from across the agency that can be implemented locally. So approaches to taking soil health to the next level in your area to engaging farmers and partners, to problem solving and continuing to find solutions that lead to increased adoption of soil health management systems. We're really excited for this because in a lot of ways we've been looking for ways to connect more in the field and while face to face is wonderful and that's really our preferred uh, mode of operations, we can't do that right now. Hope you all are well. Um, we are thinking of you all out there in the field and uh, wanting to provide you with some ways to engage so we're starting this and we're excited about it. We had so many people telling us that uh, they wanted to join us today. We'll hope these get uh, larger as we go. Um, we'll introduce the session's topic for each of these through some speakers sharing their experience. And then we'll open the floor to the audience for questions and discussion. So you can use the Q&A pod to ask your questions at any time during the presentations or discussion. We're also recording this and future conversations so that others can benefit from the expertise that's shared here today and in future sessions. Um, so we will make all that available on our Soil Health POC team. Um, if you're still getting familiar with Microsoft Teams, so are we. So we're hoping to not have any glitches today, um, but just a, a, a piece of information for those of you who may not be familiar with this. Um, to be able to join our Soil Health POC team, if you go to the left, uh, to the bottom left hand, there's a spot in Teams where you can join or create a team. If you click on that option, you can put in the code 4TQWBCO. And maybe Brandon, uh, if you can put that in the Q&A pod so that folks have that code. Again, it's 4TQWBCO. That code will allow you to join the Soil Health POC team. And basically on that team, there's a section in files where we put publications and training materials, anything that we think may be of use to you all out there, uh, that's where we're gonna store them. So that way everything is together and easily accessible. So we'll make various other technical materials available there. Just wanted to let you all know that that's an option. All of us, producers included, are learning that soil health is a journey, not a destination. I think none of us are going to ever really fully get there. I think there's always something new to learn every day for each and every one of us. So we're hoping that these conversations will inspire some of that uh, looking for those for those new pieces of information, that new insight together. Um, as we work with innovative producers, I know we all learn a lot. Um, there are folks out there who implement amazing things. They're implementing the principles of soil health in new ways um, and a lot of excitement and new passion is growing out there in farming communities. And we want to be there as an agency to really help our farming communities lead that, to help everybody make the most of that. Um, and as part of that, we want to hear from you. So as we set up this new series, for conversations, as we set that in motion, we really want to know what are your questions? What topics would you like to focus on? What things would you like to hear others talk about? What things do you find a little hard to engage on because you've never really had those conversations and you want to gain some insights from others? And on the other hand, if you're someone out there really leading in your community, you've got amazing producers you're working with, 
If you have insights, successes, solutions to challenges that you can share that you feel would be of help to others across the nation or in your region, please do let us know. We would love to hear from you. Um, in the coming months, we plan to have selected NRCS conservationists from not just our division, but across the country chime in on this conversation. So uh, we'd love to hear how you've increased soil health capacity in your area, how you've managed to increase adoption of systems that really incorporate the, the soil health management principles. If you're interested in sharing your expertise with this group by providing a short introductory presentation, so like the three that you will hear today, we'd love to hear from you. Um, if you have a particular topic and you would love to facilitate a discussion with folks across the country, we'd love to hear from you. So please reach out to us. Let us know if you've got things to share. Uh, we'd love to have this conversation turn into a informal way to engage on various topics and we'd really love for you to get engaged in that and let us know what matters most to you. So look forward to hearing from you. As for today, we're going to start this off with uh, three of our division's soil health specialists. So today we have on Marlon Winger, Doug Peterson and Nathan Lauder and they will be sharing some of their experiences in building soil health capacity across the country promoting soil health conversations and adoption in the various regions across the U.S. that they've worked in. So a few words about each of them and then we'll get going. Marlon Winger grew up on a family-owned dairy farm in Dayton, Idaho, where he found his passion for agriculture. He earned his bachelor's and master's degree in science uh, at Utah State University in plant science. Then he worked as a county agricultural agent for Utah State University Extension for nine years in Price, Utah, and he's been working for the Natural Resources Conservation Service for 14 years since then. Um, he's been an area agronomist in northern Utah, a state agronomist in Idaho, and now he's a soil health division specialist. Um, our division operates out of headquarters, uh, but we have our folks serving a number of states, each of them, and then they get involved in regional and national endeavors. So Marlin serves primarily Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, and now Utah also. And Marlon and his family continue to live on a ranch at in Casper, Wyoming, where the family raises pastures, sheep, hogs, and a few calves in a large garden. Nathan Lauder joins us. Uh, he was raised on a dairy farm in southern Stanley County in North Carolina. In 1996, that farm transitioned to a beef cattle and row crop farming enterprise. Nathan earned his bachelor degree um, in agriculture and environmental technology at NCSU and has since Oh, I'm losing my document. Nope, there it is. <laughs> he has since spent 18 years with NRCS across the state of North Carolina as a student trainee, soil conservationist and district conservationist, and uh, working with producers to address resource concerns on their farming operations and uh, efforts to improve soil health. And he is now a specialist with Soil Health Division. He serves Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Florida, and Puerto Rico. So he crosses a lot of states. Um, he continues to enjoy farming with his family while implementing mixed species covers and no-till on cropland and pasture land. Doug Peterson joins us today. He grew up on a crop and livestock farm near Newton in North Missouri. Today, he continues to operate a cow, calf and contract raising operation. He earned a bachelor's degree in agriculture with an emphasis in economics and agronomy. And he has been with NRCS for 32 years, holding positions as a soil scientist, district conservationist in both grassland and, and base counties and large cropland counties. He's been a, grass, a state grassland conservationist and a state soil health specialist. He's now with the soil health division. He is serving Missouri, Iowa and beyond and teaching NRCS staff and producers around the Midwest about soil health how it impacts virtually all natural resources processes and what type of management it will take to effectively move our soil, uh, our soil health function and productivity forward. So you can see our specialists bring a lot of expertise. Um, their training coupled with their real world, uh, real world experience, all three of them are involved in production agriculture. They're producers themselves. And so that makes them unique speakers and they can really reach agency personnel, producers and partners alike. So excited to have them all today. I am now going to switch over to Marlon and we look forward to hearing from him. So take it away, Marlon. Thank you. Thank you, Bianca, for that, uh, those introductions and uh, sure warms my heart to be able to work with guys like Nathan and Doug uh, really look up to guys like that. 
Well, soil health really started for me as a new state agronomist in Idaho. In the middle of my career, I attended two three-day soil health workshops, the, N the NEDS courses, with David Lamb and some guy named Ray Archuleta. They were the main instructors. In those three days, I learned how the soils function. And maybe for the first time, I really began to understand the carbon cycle. I magically found some professional passion and wanted others to share in my excitement. I learned to give the soil function demos to colleagues at the state office. Those are the guys pouring the colored dye in the, in the infiltration jugs. With some practice to myself, I was soon ready to teach some of Ray's soil health modules that he sent my way. It wasn't long before I called Ray and asked him to come to Idaho and teach some NRCS employees around the state. Surprisingly, he said he wasn't interested in just teaching only NRCS, but wanted producers to hear the message also. After spending countless hours on YouTube and attending a couple soil health workshops, I learned how to better communicate the principles of soil health and how to address goals and resource concerns of the producers. I found a handful of field staff that were also interested. They became my support group. Those early workshops with Ray were now 11 years ago. Before we brought in the big soil health speakers, we held local county workshops to teach producers, partners, and of course our NRCS employees. At those small producer meetings, we focused on soil health basics, soil biology, and the cover crop modules, kind of the same modules that we, we learned at the NRCS trainings. We taught all the soil functioning demonstrations. Uh, they were taught at, at all the workshops. We emphasized on the slake test, the silly string, and rainfall simulator. Those rainfall simulators had a lot of impact on, on most of us in our, in our early days. Now, most of us have seen those rainfall simulators, but we still show them at our major workshops. Fast forward 10 to 12 years and working with some very supportive state conservationists uh, in Idaho in the last two years, we've held three to four large workshops for producers and employees. Nationally renowned speakers such as Jay Pure, Jerry Doan, Gabe Brown, Christine Jones, Keith Burns, and Brendan Rocky, to name a few, have taught us. They've helped us spread the word the knowledge of regenerating our ag lands. In Idaho, for example, this year, over 850 people attended the soil health workshops. Now it's pretty common to have producers participate on a panel discussion at each of these types of workshops. Here's just a few pictures of producer type workshops. This top left picture shows the Idaho Falls uh, picture a couple years ago. But they're on their 11th annual soil health workshop. This last year, they had just a little over 250 people. Burley, Idaho in 2019 has had almost 300 people the last two consecutive years. Cut Bank, Montana was a couple years ago, but Eric Watson invited me up and I, I, I says, well, how long do you want to teach? He said, how about four hours? And I said, who's the other speakers? Eric says, you are Marlon. So that's pretty impressive that we have information that we can share with producers for four hours at a whack. Look at the people that come to Longmont, Colorado a couple of years ago. I can't even remember the number of people there, probably close to 400. And also we're starting soil health in places like uh, Utah and Nevada. After these, after a few workshops with producers, I continue to work with and meet with local DCs and a handful of producers to answer specific questions and to help them to learn to build cover crop mixes, to address their goals and resource concerns. Together, we learn about drills and planters and cover crop mixes in the field. For example, in Idaho, several years ago now, the conservation districts are, a few of them are buying drills to rent to producers. It's interesting to watch those conservation districts that have bought those drills because soil health is really flourishing in those areas. 
during this process, a good relationship is formed with this group of like minded folks. It takes it takes some time, but soon the DCs and soil cons start to ask many questions about systems, soil health systems and cover crop mixes. I did the same in the beginning of my soil health career. I found a mentor I could relate with. For example, every cover crop mix that came across my desk as a state agronomist in the early years got reviewed by John Sticka in North Dakota. He was one of several mentors for me. Using a mentor really helped me develop confidence in my communication with producers and field office employees. We learned together on tours with cover crop industry folks. And of course, we really learned fast from the innovative producer. These two diagonal pictures are with cover crop industry folks in Idaho, where we're learning about nematode resistant cover crops for sugar beets and potatoes, for example. Um, sometimes our little groups are small, two or three DCs and a soil con together, and we go visit several farms and learn together. <clears throat> Do we have all the answers? No, but are we learning together? Yes. Do we have some failures and do we have a few droughts? Of course we do. That's where other soil health innovative producers help out in producer panels, visiting their farms with field staff. We continue, we continue to learn from the national type speakers. Although the national speakers have different systems, we realize that the principles of soil health are universal. I think that's a quote from some guy in North Dakota. Some years we've had fours in during the drought year in the cover crops. I'm looking at the bottom left hand corner. <clears throat> the cover crop only grew six or eight inches and started withering away, but it was still successful and people came out to learn and we continued to try and push forward. The bottom right picture is actually Keith Burns coming to Idaho and we prepped this whole workshop by planting about a five or 10 acre uh, piece of land to different cover crops and mixes. So we had something to teach people when they came to the workshop. This is just a collage of pictures from field days that we've had in Sundance, Wyoming, one of our hot spots of soil health in the state. <clears throat> the first time I met Tom Wolf was building a cover crop mix during lunch at a field day. I built the mix for him on the back of his paper plate. Well, I didn't have my laptop there, so that was always a fond memory of working with producers and getting to know them pretty quickly. These field tours and demonstra demonstration of some of the soil health assessment are some fond memories I will always have in my professional career as we've learned together. Some people ask, how do we know if we're making a difference? Like Bianca said, I was a county extension agent for almost 10 years. I think I know I'm starting to make a little difference when we have 50 people come to a soil health field day or when 850 people attend soil health workshops at the state level. Just in closing, I love this statement on one of our soil health fact sheets and it really helped me change my own paradigms about soil function. Quote, if you're trying to make your soil healthier, you shouldn't see it very often. We used to laugh about the biggest turnip or the radish, and I think these would have won the state contest that year, but of course we never had a contest, just amongst ourselves. Now I get really excited to see 100 head of feeder calves on a cover crop field, on a cover crop for a day or two, and then move to the next pasture or having some professional satisfaction when I knew I could do better than just planting a single turnip compared to a 10 way cover crop mix. I hope all you guys that are listening out there that we can continue to push soil health forward in our great states we call home. With that, Bianca, as we transition presenters, is there any questions that happen to pop up? Hey everybody, if anybody's got one or two questions for Marlon, we can take a handful of the questions while Nathan gets ready. 
And Nathan, when you share your screen, it should pop up for me so I can send that live. Any questions out there for Marlon? You can either type them into the Q&A pod or you can unmute yourself. And Nathan, I'm not seeing your PowerPoint yet, so we will try to work on that. I'm going to send your video live. Oh, can't do that. Sorry, folks, we're still uh, experiencing how to run a live event. It looks like you've got the PowerPoint there. Um, Nathan, if you share your screen, then you'll be able to run it. Yeah, yes, Nathan, you're ready to go. OK, so are you you're able to see my title slide there? Well, you got to go to presenter view. So we see your notes right now. You need to just expand the PowerPoint. Okay. Oh no. Uh oh. Any luck right there? F5 on your computer. Yes. What about now? There we go. There we go. That looks yep. better. It seems uh, that there are some technical difficulties, especially when going from a regular Microsoft Teams meeting to a live meeting as well. So uh, hell, uh, thanks, Bianca. Thanks, Marlon. Uh, and we'll get to hear from Doug as well. Uh, but just wanted to say hello to NRCS and Conservation Partners. Uh, but, you know, I think about it and I often get a question across the southeast from uh, planning staff and conservation partners, where or how do we start promoting soil health in our area? Well, the famous answer applies here. It depends. You can see from the photos. You can see from these photos that there can be variability in where your producers or clients may be, whether they're practicing no-till like on the left conservation tillage, or even conventional tillage managements. So the step we follow to reach a soil health management system with each of those producers would be different. I'm going to talk a few minutes about how I started a soil health movement in my area when I was a district conservationist. So a little bit about where I started. I had the opportunity to start my NRCS career in the home county of our founder, Dr. Hugh Hammond Bennett, and the home of the nation's first conservation district, Brown Creek Solar Water. From there, I continued to work across North Carolina's mountains, Piedmont, and coastal plain in different capacities from a student trainee, a soil conservationist, and then to a district conservationist. In 2015, I applied for a position with the newly formed Soil Health Division and now cover a range of states, as Bianca stated, in the Southeast. When I started with NRCS and learned about all the different conservation practices, I felt that if we could get producers to the point where no-till was widely adopted on cropland, that we would make strong efforts in addressing resource concerns across the state of North Carolina. 
Turns out I was wrong, bad wrong. While we did have some success, we were still seeing substantial resource concerns like these above. On cropland that had been no-till for many years, counting back to the mid 80s. I was troubled by these increasing instances of resource concerns like soil erosion, lack of crop rotation, increasing soil temps, and challenging herbicide resistant weeds on no-till cropland. And we were always continually asking the, que the question and asking myself, why were these systems failing? In 2007, I had the opportunity to serve as a district conservationist in an area close to my home county where no-till had been prevalent for many years. In returning, I found that those same resource concerns were abundant across the rolling hills of the Piedmont clay type soils. We often had spirited debates in the office amongst ourselves on what was the cause of these resource concerns we were seeing. Of course, the obvious gully erosion was a common topic of discussion. With all the debate, we comp compromised and settled that since those fields had been no-till for so many years that the soil had increased tilt and more frequent heavy summer downpours swept that loose friable soil away. Well, it turns out, yep, we were wrong again. Well, there could be a small amount of validity to those thoughts. We found ourselves thinking about how to address these resource concerns with a single or small groups of conservation practices which commonly we did, um, and they also did not line up with the producers, of, uh, producers' objectives. Challenges that we were facing were things like larger agriculture equipment and narrow crop markets. And that forced us to think of alternatives to address the resource concerns that we were seeing. Also in 2007, our North Carolina state agronomist, Steve Woodruff, introduced field staff of North Carolina to a very unique individual that Marlon has already mentioned, Mr. Ray Archuleta. His message was, was something that few of us had heard before, soil health. I found myself asking, what was this? What conservation standard is that? As the training progressed, the picture became more and more clear, revealing that what I had been missing all along. Soil health was more than just any one practice. It was a system containing many practices that were reliant on each other to support a functioning soil that we were indeed missing across a lot of the land in the nation. It was truly a, a light bulb moment for me that changed the way I approached conservation planning and farming as well in the area that I covered. But the question still remained, how would I relate this to producers so that adoption could be possible? We have numerous conservation tools at our disposal, but at the time, soil health was not a listed resource concern. It was an opportunity for me to seek out those individuals who were promoting soil health, whether they were producers like Mr. Ray Steyer or conservationists like Gene Hardy, Jay Fuhrer, David Lamb, and researchers like Buzz Klute and Dr. Alan Franzlubers who were all making efforts to spread adoption of soil health. In doing this, opportunities arose to attend field days and conferences where soil health was a focus. I later promoted soil health locally by hosting workshops and field days to get the word out to our producers and conservation partners on the benefits of soil health management. Another instrumental part of our soil health movement was to get local support. It was important that our local soil and water conservation district board was supportive. From there, we could then include other conservation partners like extension and industry. Two of my local board members pictured here and myself attended a soil health workshop in North Dakota that proved to be a game changer for those producers as well. They were so moved by what they saw that each of them had cover crop seed nearly beat them back home for planting that fall. This effort by those supervisors would give other producers of the area interest and confidence that, that this management could be applied to their local systems. 
With this new knowledge on the importance of complete soil health management systems, we were able to make some determinations on why we were seeing the increasing resource concerns. While testing infiltration is variable, if we complete multiple measurements, we can draw some conclusions about the managements our producers are following. What we see in, the, in our area is that continuous no-till averages approximately a quarter inch of rainfall, um, while no-till with diverse cover crop infiltrates approximately three inches of rainfall. We can also see similar results from grazing managements of the area as well. Continuous grazed pasture has the ability to infiltrate approximately similarly a quarter inch of rainfall, while rotational grazed pasture systems have the ability to infiltrate approximately four inches of rainfall on the soils of this area. What we concluded from our assessments on infiltration across these managements was that we did not have a soil erosion problem. We had an infiltration problem. The evident soil erosion and other resource concerns were being caused by an underlying missing pieces of a complete soil health management system. So as conservation planners, what do we plan for? Most of you know by now have seen and are been exposed to those soil health planning principles. When we look at how Mother Nature manages most systems across the nation, we see that all of the principles are being addressed. We can compare management's ability to infiltrate sustainably or sustainably more rainfall when compared to other managements that we saw earlier. While it is not our goal to manage all land as forest or prairie, we can relate those principles to all cropping or grazing systems that we see. And looking back at our cropland example with a soil erosion resource concern, we can address that with multiple conservation practices that support a soil health management system rather than just a single practice to address the goal erosion that is clearly evident. We must challenge ourselves to think about what part of the system is missing. So I worked with producers initially by promoting the use of cover crops. While in the back of my mind as a planner, I was thinking about the complete system of conservation tillage, crop rotation, residue management, nutrient and pest management. I think we were successful in this approach by not overwhelming pro producers with so many conservation practices. The implementation of those cover crops was a great tool that addressed multiple resource, concern, multiple resource concerns. And that put producers on a path to implementing a soil health management system. So we have the opportunity and some of us as, as NRCS are, are, are conservation partners. A lot of times when we get in an area, we may have a small amount of acreage that we uh, have the ability to farm or, or graze, um, but we also have the opportunity to practice what we preach. So I thought a, a huge portion of getting adoption was to do some demos um, across uh, that county that I was covering. That way we could establish that more confidence uh, to producers uh, that they could see that these systems would work. This could be done in this area. If you don't have the luxury of, of being able to have some land that you can control and do these kind of plots, that's where it can come back to those partnerships with your local board because a lot of times the producers are on those boards could facilitate, and if, especially if you have buy-in from those producers, you can establish some of these demonstration plots on your uh, on their land. That way, they be, they can become mentors. We can also see that once this takes off, it, it kind of piques interest of other producers of the area. So the, the initial year, the the top two photos here are actually. Uh, equipment that was modified by those two solar water supervisors. But we saw the next year that a neighbor had a similar type modification done to a piece of equipment. We can also see that equipment that had been previously, previously used in conventional management was now being repurposed and using to roll cover crops and then including a spray bar to help terminate. 
And another thing we did of, of those demonstration plots is even though the area that I was was covering was traditionally no till and there was the use of some cover crops, a lot of times those cover crops would be established very late in, after in the cropping season and then terminated uh, very soon in the spring. So producers wasn't accustomed to planting into so much residue um, like we would have when establishing these cover crops to help build a soil health management system. So one thing we had to do was show that we could plant in these types of residues. And a lot of time we were experiencing residue biomass in 8,000 plus pounds per acre um, is the type of growth that we got. Here in the southeast, we have a tremendous opportunity to grow these types of covers. And we can see by the picture here that we have uh, opportunity to build quite a bit of biomass. So we can see here in the photo that we have corn that was planted without road cleaners. Just a traditional no-till planter. So we can see another shot of that. This is that. Uh, so there was no need to make any major adjustments other than routine maintenance on this piece of equipment to make sure things were up to spec. And we were able to plant. You can see a close up there of that actual planter unit, just a traditional no-till uh, planter unit. And we were able to plant into this. So while I was doing this as a demo on the farming portion that I have with my father, I was also, you know, getting a little bit of opposition, which was good. It was challenging me to make sure that that was something that we could do and often got quite a bit of pushback from uh, my father, which is now a full believer in it and actually has, uh, you know, kind of changed roles and he's pushing me even further. But at this time, he, he would pretty much counted on having a crop failure. So after we planted, we took some time, allowed for germination, terminated those covers, and we went back. And we can see that we got successful germination and uh, was on our way to having a successful cash crop for that season. So this was just a, you know, a little, a few minutes there that I was discussing about how I uh, implemented getting soil health promoted in my area. And I hope that you were able to glean something from this and would be able to use that in promoting soil health of your area. And Bianca, I'll turn that back over to you. All right, if there are any quick questions for Nathan, we've got a couple moments. Um, question or two, anybody from the audience want to ask while we get ready for Doug? Bianca, we have I'm one. I'm looking at our Q&A pod. Yeah, go ahead, Brandon. Oh, the question was, what's the, um, what was the modification to the sprayer, Nathan? Um, were you broadcasting cover crops during an herbicide application? Uh, so that photo with the old cultipacker, old cultipacker, um, they were actually terminating those cover crops. So they were using that piece of equipment to roll them down, and then a spray bar had been added to the back of that cultipacker to help terminate those covers. All right, I'm going to turn over to Doug Peterson. Thanks, Doug, for joining us. Take it away. All right, Bianca, thank you. <clears throat> and thanks to everybody for joining us today. You know, there's <clears throat> several ways to educate and promote soil health um, to, to our staff and to producers. <clears throat> Excuse me, I don't think that, you know, anything I've done is necessarily the best way. You know, you've heard from Nathan and Marlon what they've done. Other people have had a lot of success. I know uh, in Indiana, Barry Fisher had a lot of success developing partnerships with other organizations. So people all over the nation really have <clears throat> developed their own unique ways of training staff. When I headed down this road about <clears throat> 12 years ago or so, I was a state grassland conservationist and so I was trying to think about how to train people from a, a, a state standpoint. I wanted to train the whole state. So my, <clears throat> my angle is going to be a little different maybe from Nathan's from a field office. So uh, <clears throat> I didn't think up a specific process. You know, it kind of just developed over time. So we're going to walk you through that process um, and kind of how it evolved as we went through.
early on, I knew we needed to have some expert help. You know, I knew that I needed some help. I needed some training for myself. So beginning about 2010, I just I just took people where I wanted to go. You know, for a couple of years, uh, we sent groups to to uh, North Dakota to learn from Jay Fuhr. We were actually up there at the same time that that Nathan and his and his uh, board members were. You know, and those were some great trips. And the folks that went on those early trips really formed some some great bonds, and <clears throat> they were exposed to things that we never would have been exposed to here in Missouri. But I knew we just could not afford to send everybody to North Dakota. We had to train our own people here in the state of Missouri. Um, <clears throat> you know, I do think it's critical for folks to go to other places, whether it be to a conference or a field day in another state. Um, I think that's where you really get exposed to, to to, to out of the box thinking that maybe you just didn't think up in your own area. So we came back we, after those after those trips to North Dakota, we came back to Missouri um, and started doing all kinds of different things. You know, uh, like like most everybody else, we invited Ray Archuleta in. Um, we did our own state version of that soil health and sustainability course. It was kind of a two trade training for for folks around the the state. Um, we also sent groups to this to that course, but early on we just couldn't send everybody to it. So, you know, <clears throat> here the the picture. Steve Hefner was a water quality specialist here in Missouri, who really helped us out in those early years. Um, we held landowner workshops. We did a lot of different things uh, as we as we ran around the <clears throat> the state. You know, we bought <clears throat> we bought rainfall simulators um, and trained to select staff for 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 that. Um, you know, purchasing those rainfall simulators were probably some of the best money we ever spent. Um, if you set them up right and, and do that slake do slake demo with them, um, they can just be an incredibly memorable event for anybody that sees them for the first time. Um, <clears throat> this one on the screen was actually a, a one that was particularly memorable for, for some of the local staff members in that Greenfield office who thought their the, the soil, one of the trays came from a, a staff member's farm and, and he thought it should uh, function a lot better than it really ended up doing. So, um, you know, that individual now is one of the one of the best soil health advocates that Missouri has. So I guess, <clears throat> I guess early on, I, I would say I'd, I'd kind of go anywhere and do anything to promote soil health. We didn't really have a specific strategy or game plan. It was just kind of me running all over talking soil health to anybody who would listen. We had, <clears throat> we had some success in some areas. Um, one example that you see here was the the Mid-Missouri Soil Health Conference in Boonville. You know, that field office there in Boonville early on, this was probably 12 or 13, 2012 or 2013. They wanted to do a landowner workshop. <clears throat> they had a great venue available there. So I suggested they just go for broke and, and, <clears throat> and have a big workshop. And, and so after, after, the second year they had 400 in attendance. You know, now they've held it every year since. And so uh, it, it's just, a, it's a tremendous conference. So, so while we had some success around the state, oops, I Looks think like I'm we in lost back your PowerPoint. Now. Yeah, There's sorry. your PowerPoint. There it is. Good, good. Yep, we're good. Sorry. <clears throat> so we so we had some success, um, but but what what we found happening more often than not was <clears throat> I, I would do a meeting in a county, and 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 you know I'd I'd move on to the next county, and when I'd look back a couple years later that that county was kind of dead in the water. And, and, and it was my fault. I hadn't given them enough training and enough education, enough information to really be able to, uh, to, 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 to go on and work with producers in that county. 
Um, and so what, what I learned from that was that, that whatever method um, of training we use um, to train our staff can't be a one and done deal. You know, you can't do one meeting or, or even send staff to a three day course uh, and, and expect them to know everything they need to know to effectively work with producers on a subject as, as complex as soil health. You know, we really need to send all of our staff to, to multiple events um, multiple times a year to to really uh, to really move forward as an agency. I think that also includes our state and even national leadership. You know, our leaders need to see firsthand the power of soil health and they need to see how much our understanding of soil function has changed in the last oh, 15 years or so. You know, today's science of soil function was just not available when many of our older conservation practices were developed. You know, the picture on that bottom left is a is a classic example. Um, you know, it's a terrace channel full of sediment, a fairly new set of terraces. You know, when, when the practice of terraces were developed decades ago, we didn't really have that that understanding of, of what builds and what degrades aggregate stability that we have today. You know, in terraces, while while they may prevent some erosion from from leaving that field, they really don't prevent erosion from occurring because they don't impact aggregate stability. Um, you know, practices like no-till and cover crops that treat that aggregate stability on every single square foot of that soil. Um, that's that's really what we need to focus on. And and I think un until we focus on on that until we focus our, our training efforts on, on soil health and understanding aggregate stability and promoting practices that treat the root cause of the problem um, and not just, not just on practices and, and, and effort that treat symptoms, um, we're gonna move forward fairly slowly as an agency. So we knew that we needed to um, expand our, our training focus. We needed to get to get more specific, we need to get more detailed with all of those topics. Um, years of talking about programs had cost to some of our staff some, some technical expertise as an agency. So we went back to basics. Um, we brought in folks like Barry Fisher from Indiana, Paul Yaza from University of Nebraska to talk about equipment. Um, equipment had changed pretty dramatically. Um, you know, farmers could still use their older planters, but again, a lot of technology had changed, so we needed to bring our folks up to speed on that. Um, we brought Jay Fuhr down from uh, uh, North Dakota to have a statewide district conservationist meeting and talk about how they were integrating soil health into program activity um, and conservation planning. We brought in Jill Clapperton to talk about soil biology, um, and there were many other speakers, and, you, and you've, you've heard most of those mentioned already, but we brought folks in from all over so we could get very specific, pointed, uh, targeted training for our folks. Um, <clears throat> so as we learned what, wor what worked and didn't work, um, we kind of changed our training methods, particularly me as, as I went around training. Um, and, and then when I added Iowa about five years ago as a regional specialist, I knew I, knew I needed to get a little more, a little more pointed in that training. Um, um, in, in what we did, <clears throat> you know, I knew that that uh, I needed to work with producers, but I also knew that we needed to train our staff because I think they go together. You know, if, if we have landowners in a county that are excited, but we don't have the staff there to answer questions and diagnose problems, those landowners are going to get are going to get fairly frustrated uh, quickly. But but on the other hand, if you don't have landowners that are excited, then it's going to be pretty easy for the staff to kind of just move on and do whatever the landowners want. <clears throat> you know, I was very fortunate <clears throat> in, in both Missouri and Iowa, you know, that state conservationist Kurt Simon and, and state conservationist and former state conservationist J.R. Flores in Missouri um, understood that soil health was really the future of NRCS. You know, they had started doing lots of, of soil health training, um, including uh, the training that I mentioned earlier, and then sending folks to the Shas courses. You know, both have sponsored several uh, 
state sponsored SHAS courses in their states for several years. So what I found was happening was generally after one of these three day courses, our staff would they would get excited. They would be fired up and they would they would they would uh, you know, they had three days of training that really opened their eyes to all the things that the soil can be. But, but they really still had trouble communicating with producers about soil health. Um, answering questions and overcoming those objections from producers was still was still a bit of a challenge. <clears throat> so so as I started to do quite a bit of work in Iowa, I tried to learn from my mistakes that I made in Missouri. You know, when when folks would call me up and say, "Hey, we wanted to do something for soil health." Here's what I'd tell them, you know, <clears throat> if they're excited and they really want to put some effort into it, into their county, to their community, I'll come and do three meetings. One will be an uh, introduction to soil health workshop. One is a field day where producers can see soil health firsthand and then in an advanced soil health workshop. Um, <clears throat> you know, that intro workshop will change how producers see the soil and it will help work on that culture of, of tillage that's just so pervasive in agriculture. The field day will let them see firsthand what, what soil health management can really do. You know, it, it, <clears throat> it'll show them that it's possible to do uh, in their area. And then that advanced workshop finally gives them that step-by-step -step process. You know, for that first introductory workshop, <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I, I tell them I want at least 100 people at that first at that first meeting. You know, a lot of our offices haven't had a meeting of that size and they really. You know, they don't think they can get that many folks there. Why? Well, I, I just ask them to get out their phone book and, and call everybody they've ever worked with. Go to the co-ops, go to the equipment dealers, seed dealers, churches, whoever will listen to them. They've got to generate some momentum and that's going to take some effort. You know, I think it's also a, a great team building exercise for that office. Um, very few of them, if they really pull together and put some effort into it, very few of them will have less than 100 folks there. You know, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we, we, we even worked with public affairs specialists to put together a flyer on how to have a successful meeting. You know, it went over several of the things that we hadn't thought of, window covers, food, sponsors, projectors, all kinds of things that just help them have a good meeting um, that, that can provide that best learning environment for those producers. You know, at that, at that first workshop, I'm also going to ask them to have uh, three or four local producers who can be on a farmer panel. You know, and honestly, early on, I was afraid that maybe we wouldn't be able to find a no tiller a no tiller in, in every county um, but I you know that was really it, it wasn't a problem there's there's a there's a good no till farmer in almost every county in this country um, you just got to look for them you know a lot of times those field offices didn't necessarily know those people but uh, this this was a great opportunity for that staff to get out and find those the, the no tillers the cover croppers the grazers um, in, in their county and really get to know a little bit about their operation. The second, the second part of that three, three meeting series is going to be a field day. Um, we're going to get people out and we're going to look at those cover crops. You know, a lot of them just haven't taken the time to investigate what, what no-till and cover crops really are. They have maybe read an article or or, or heard a little something about it or heard somebody complain about it. But we want to get them out there and we want to show them some equipment. <clears throat> um, we've even had uh, planes fly on cover crops um, at the field day, um, show drill uh, planting cover crops, show, show species, show um, different timing of planting. Do, do as mentioned, as uh, Marlon mentioned, you know, do some plantings at different times of the of the of the growing season so they can see what what timing does for us you know fall is just a really critical time a couple of weeks difference in planting date in the fall makes a huge difference in that in that cover crop growth 
So we just really want to expose them to a healthy soil. <clears throat> we want to show them some aggregation. We want to show them some roots. Um, we might do <clears throat> some infiltration rings. We might do a rainfall simulator if they hadn't seen that already. Um, we just want them to get out there and really, <clears throat> really take a look at something. And so then we'll, <clears throat> we'll move on from that field day to that final advanced workshop. Um, and that's where we're really going to start tying it all together. It's really going to get linked. Um, Barry, system, Barry Fisher has a really good systems uh, talk, and we'll, we'll generally do a big portion of that. <clears throat> we're going to discuss equi equipment a little bit more. Um, we're going to talk about uh, cover crops, and, and, and we're going to talk about um, being very specific in selecting a cover crop species. Um, we're not just going to go out there and willy-nilly plant a cover crop. We're going to be very specific in that. Um, we want to make sure that they understand or at least are exposed to carbon nitrogen ratios um, and how they impact mineralization and mobilization. That's kind of a kind of a black box to a lot of folks. So we're really going to Gonna, gonna walk them through that because as their soil changes, as we add cover crops, that that mineralization and mobilization becomes really, really critical. Um, so we're gonna walk those producers through a step by step process on how to get started, um, and we're gonna we're gonna try to make it very specific to the part of the state or the area that we're in. You know, um, and I think I think from a training standpoint watching a, another person, watching somebody deal with those questions and objections from those producers firsthand is some of that best training we can offer our staff. So that's why we generally, when we have these landowner workshops, we really want to invite um, staff from from uh, field offices all, all around that county. We don't want just, you know, just producers there. I think that 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 interaction between staff and producers is really key. And I think we've kind of lost that um, to a certain extent over the years. Um, <clears throat> so that so that three meeting process, um, we would really like that to happen in less than a year. Um, and, and honestly, six months is better. Um, if we want to generate some excitement and then keep it going, um, so that it's not just excitement, but that excitement actually turns into activity, then I think that's that's where we've got to make it happen fairly quickly. You know, I know we need to build this capacity into our staff across the whole country. Um, <clears throat> I think this this three meeting process is some of the best training we can give our staff. You know, it gets them directly involved with key producers and even industry leaders in their community. Um, it shows our staff how to deal with landowner objections. It generates excitement in their in their community. I mean, it's just a great team building exercise. So if all goes as planned, <clears throat> I kind of walk away with with not much future involvement, leaving behind a field office that is excited, you know, has that knowledge and ability to tackle pretty much anything that comes up from a soil health standpoint. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me, you know, but as a state, I don't think we can for, forget to keep up those those ongoing specific topic trainings. Um, we need to keep we need to keep building that capacity. We need to keep uh, building that knowledge base on those specific topics um, multiple times a year as as we build that capacity in our staff. You know, and I think <clears throat> I think that. That developing soil leaders is 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 the key. You know, here's a great example. You know, these are four Missouri soil health specialists. Um, left to right, you know, we've got Drexel Atkinson. He was a district conservationist and a grazer himself. Uh, Warren Cork was a resource conservationist down in the Boot Hill in Missouri, um, and he was a former industry agronomist who specialized in soybean genetics. Luke Skinner. Um, <clears throat> was a resource forester and a grazer. David Doctorian, um, there in the, the pink shirt, no hat, the only no hat guy that day, um, was the nutrient management specialist and a farmer as well. So my, my point here is, you know, it doesn't take a specific background or even education. What it really takes in our people is passion, 
ambition and a willingness to learn. You know, in my 32 years, I have never seen any topic, any subject, any practice, anything in our agency that has opened up and generated the passion that, that Soil Health has. Um, we have an opportunity right now that is just incredible to, to change uh, and, and, and influence uh, NRCS and, and all of the activity that NRCS can do. You know, we've got folks all over the country who are willing to step up. We just got to make sure that we get them the ongoing training that they need to be able to do that job. Um, thanks uh, for letting me walk you through the journey that <clears throat> that I've been through here in Missouri and Iowa. And Bianca, I guess I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much, Doug. Thanks everybody for joining. We have come to the part of the conversation where we really wanted to make a good conversation. However, uh, we discovered last uh, yesterday afternoon that a Microsoft Teams event is limited to 250 people um, and we're suggested that we make it a live event and now we're discovering that that means you don't have control over your mute and we really would like you to be able to join in. Um, so while we have the Q&A pod, we also have uh, creatively come up with another option, which is if you let us know in the Q&A pod that you would like to be able to ask a question live or respond to questions live, which we would really like you to be able to do, um, then if you let us know that you're interested, we will make you a presenter for this event, and that will allow you to control your mute button the way that you have been used to in the Microsoft Teams events. So we would really love for you to participate that way. Um, I'm just about to send that in the Q&A pod. We've got Barry Fisher also joining us, so he will help me facilitate the conversation so that I can also be uh, bringing people in um, as you let me know, I'll watch the Q&A pod and I will make you a presenter, which then means that you can ask that question or join the conversation. So with that, I wanna open up the floor for the moment, we just have Soil and Soil Health Division folks on, um, but we will bring you in. So if you have questions, you can type them in the Q&A pod. We can, uh, Barry will read them off or, or sometimes I will and we'll answer them, but also uh, you can type them in and, and let me know that you want to join or just let me know I'd like to join and I will try to get you all into the conversation as fast as I can. So that's how we're going to handle that. Please go right ahead. Um, and I am looking at our Q&A pod here and the first question I'm getting, um, uh, there was a question about the code, we'll answer that online. Um, and so far, let's see, there's a question from Andrew. Have you been able to quantify the economic benefits or possible losses due to soil health management systems? Specifically, many of the comparison photos clearly show soil health practices benefiting site conditions and processes. But is there an economic benefit to the landowner? If there is, is it in the first growing season or long term? So that's our first question. Who on our panel would like to handle that? Go ahead, Marlon. I, I think I think everybody can probably do a tid, tidbit about it. But uh, one of my first one of my first <clears throat> opportunities to meet with a no-till producer uh, was a little little teed off about the economics of soil health uh, in a good way. He said that his first year of, of no-till saved him. Uh, he used to spend 10,000, he used to buy 10,000 gallons of diesel a year. His first year of no-till, he only bought three, he only used 3,000 gallons. Uh, so, you know, he saved 7,000 gallons his very first season. And of course, that's a long-term system. The easiest, one of the easiest ways to see that economics is the reduced tillage. In Boise, Idaho, when I was working there, a lot of our soil health innovators say, said it would save them a hundred bucks easy uh, on reduced tillage. Now, as some of our soil health innovators start implementing multiple practices, they're starting to see the soil function again and fertilizer rates are reduced. Pesticide uses are cut in half, if not more. Herbicide applications are drastically reduced. So yes, it's pretty easy to document these uh, economic opportunities. 
And I just want to chime in and say we've had uh, a CIG with American Farmland Trust. They have published eight economic case studies so far. So if you Google NRCS soil health economic case studies, you'll find those pretty easily. We're also working with multiple other partners, including through all of the folks who have been funded on soil health demo trials. And those soil health demonstration trials that are now part of CIG uh, will churn out a whole number of case studies that are economic case studies. So just wanted to mention that there's some out there already and there's a lot more coming. Anybody else on the economics question? And again, a reminder, if you would like to speak on the pod, then we will definitely bring you on so that you can do that. So please let us know if you'd like to answer, ask a question live, if you have comments to chime in. Uh, we were really hoping for this to be a, a full on conversation, um, which can sometimes be tricky with that many people, but I think that we could make that happen. So if you'd like to speak, please do let us know. Bianca, I would like to take another shot at the question that was asked to me earlier. I, I think I misunderstood it a little bit after I was reviewing the Q&A pod here. Um, the question was asked about the modification to the sprayers. So those producers um, made those innovative changes because in our area, cotton has a tendency to be a, a, a very long, um, uh, a long period of time that that crop is being grown. So we would get into later fall, could be late November, December, uh, when produce, producers would be harvesting cotton and then have an opportunity to establish a cover crop after the conclusion of that crop. So those producers were uh, making those modifications to add those spreaders on the front of those sprayers or behind in some instances to actually seed those cover crops probably a month or so earlier when they were and they were timing that with the defoliation of their cotton. Uh, that way that the cover crop seed would be out there and then after the leaves were falling off of the cotton with the defoliation, those fall rains and moisture would help germinate that cover crop. And then it also would not impede the, the harvest of the cotton as well. Thanks, Nathan. I'm also seeing there was a question, did your field office ever have a customer apply for the EQIP demo contracts? I'm wondering, uh, this is from somebody anonymous, so if you could clarify what you meant there. Um, if you are talking about the soil health demonstration trials that are part of the new Farm Bill CIG, um, there are nine big projects that are funded across the US and the deadline for the next set is on the 29th of May. So if that's what you were referring to, then uh, hopefully that answers that question. There's a number of those out there, um, but this may have been a question for something else. So looking at the new comments coming in here you, and Barry, feel free to chime in on some of the questions that we knew we already had ahead of time. And go ahead, Nathan. Uh, yes, that uh, the question there, they were asking a few years ago, um, there was provisions put in I can't remember if it was CSP or EQIP, it may have been EQIP, that producers could do demo trials uh, with cover crops or soil health. Uh, and it may have been also associated with adaptive nutrient management to some extent. Um, but no, that was, uh, those came along after I was a district conservationist. So I have not had that, but I know in North Carolina, there are a few DCs in this state that had completed those demo trials with producers. I see another excellent question that's come in, which is, do you have examples or advice for dealing with the workload problem? This is a well-known problem. The field office staff who love soil health, but are just too busy with the financial assistance workload, obligating uh, contracts, all of that. Um, so the extras, outreach events, demonstrations, um, are just really hard to get to. So uh, do you have some examples or advice? Barry, Marlon, Nathan, Doug, anybody else who wants to chime in on that? I'll just I'll just throw a couple of things in there. I know I know the the field offices are, are swamped with all kinds of stuff. Um, that was one of the one of the reasons we brought Jay Fuhr down to Missouri several years ago was to try to to try to help them you know, uh, 
change that focus of, of, of you know, planning all these other practices it, and, and really make it focus on soil health practices. And it, and it was fairly successful here in Missouri. We went from the number one uh, cost shared equip uh, practice was terraces to now the number one cost shared equip practice is, uh, is cover crops. So, I mean, I think they just have to, I know they have, you know, that they have goals for, for cost share. They have goals for contracts. Um, and I think that's just where we need to get the focus on, 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 on soil health practices. And I think that's a, it, it's a, it's a slow process to change that mentality over, but that was kind of what I, what I mentioned in, in changing our focus from just practices that treat symptoms to practices that treat root causes. And I think if we do that, I think that the, you know, the time to do it w will take care of itself. Yeah, and I would, I would uh, chime in. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep, sure yes. can, Barry. <clears throat> One of the things, I don't know if Shannon Zazula is on or not, but I've heard him say numerous times that as our training uh, improved and as we uh, brought, allowed a lot of our, our field staff to attend workshops with their producers uh, and, and we're hearing kind of the same technology advancements at the same time. As you're putting together a contract then, now you've got a, you've got a producer that really wants this to work. They're really motivated for this system to get into place and you've got a, a conservation planner sitting right with them that has been to the same training that heard the same information. So there's continuity of understanding. And as you as you have both of those coming together to put a, together a contract, we actually have a higher quality contract and a higher quality contract that, that has the things in the logical order uh, of the produ what what the producer really wants to do. And because they've seen seen this at a workshop, they see the practical side, they're very motivated. And, and that, that leads to fewer contract modifications, that lead, leads to uh, just a, a far more expedited process of getting that contract to fruition. And so, so I, I think uh, uh, you know, training all of our people, including our customers at the same time is, is, is actually beneficial. And don't forget uh, working with those crop consultants and even invite the ag retailers because indirectly they're going to send people to your office with better information to to put into those contracts to put into those programs that make logical sense and if they understand how to help that producer implement that plan all those things help that contract uh, and those program dollars be spent more efficiently and i just i just got to throw that out there because i've seen that happen and i know i know uh I've, I've talked to Shannon about that here in Indiana and, and he's seen that or he feels like he sees that as well and he might even have documentation to share that. I hate to throw him under the bus and have the world come asking for that information but but I have heard him say that on numerous occasions. We also had a uh, I had a question about disease and, and Nathan, I know down in it, this one was specifically talking about additional diseases from bacteria and fungi in the southeast where you guys get a lot, a lot more humid weather and things. Uh, but as 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 producers move into these soil health systems, do they have to be a lot more concerned about soil disease and bacteria and, and all that kind of stuff? Is that becoming a major problem for a lot of your producers? You might want to address that, Nathan. Yep, so when we have producers in transition, it seems that that is when they may experience some of those uh, increased challenges with disease or whatever. But what we're finding is that the, the challenges that they're being faced with are no greater than what their neighbor under a different management would be. And what we really find is when these producers get a little further down the road of having a complete soil health management system in place, there's a lot of balance out there. Um, so even if there are some uh, introductions of disease or something, usually there are some things in place that can help counter uh, the effects of that.
Some questions that were submitted ahead of time. One of those questions was uh, something along the lines of uh, what are some ways that you've engaged and leveraged partners as you've developed these producer workshops? I know different states have had a lot of success with uh, working with partners. And so uh, there's some folks out there looking for suggestions for um, how to get people started, how to get partners to lead in soil health in their state, how to really bring them in um, how to share across the resources that all the partners bring to the table along with NRCS, those kinds of things. Wondering if you all would want to comment on that. I would just say that um, in, in our area, having those partners and collaborating with as, as many people uh, as possible is great because when you look at it from the big picture, is those producers are are everyone's clients um so we're, we're all providing a service to them so there's so many opportunities that we can collaborate together whether uh providing a conference or a field day or a workshop or a, an event like this um it's, it's, there's always a benefit to those producers to get them as much information that will benefit them as possible uh, I would just, you know, also uh, say that, you know, having in some states, a lot of the, the NRCS folks are uh, co-located with soil and water districts. So there's great opportunity there to provide um, those partnerships as well. I know that th that structure is different in different states across the nation, um, but having those soil and water district folks is really instrumental uh, a lot of times in, in facilitating some of the events that we have. Another question that we have received previously. Um, some folks out there are new to soil health. How do you get other speakers to come to a producer workshop, especially how do you get some of the nationally renowned speakers who are really motivational to come to your state and who pays for them? Bianca, maybe I can answer that in part. Uh, <clears throat> I think that's what we're here for is to help support you guys in that role. We, we, we know these soil health speakers around the nation fairly well. Uh, if, if you see a lot of these big speakers come to no-till on the plains or national no-till meetings, et cetera, uh, we can certainly help you. You can send us an email anytime or your state point of contacts may be able to help you. Uh, how you pay for them, sometimes they're expensive and, and uh, but we've been very well, we've been very blessed to, to learn from them. So it's generally been up to the districts uh, to come up with that speaker money. Some of our states uh, ha have partnered with our districts uh, to bring that money in and partners. And we're, we're seeing uh, partners such as the Nature Conservancy District in our western region really want to help out in being a partner in these soil health workshops. One thing I'll add to that, Marlon, um, you know, we, we've had a lot of a lot of speakers come in um, and, you know, involve industry, you know, industry, whether it be equipment dealers, whether it be seed dealers, um, there's a there's a ton of them that are willing to to throw a few hundred dollars each at a at a meeting if they could set up a table. Um, and, you know, and it's been very well received, um, you know. Don't even really have to give them any time on the agenda, just let them set up a table. Um, and and I know there's some issues there again from an NRCS standpoint, but generally these meetings are being put on by the soil districts. So, um, you know, those soil districts, if they sponsor that meeting and then they throw a few dollars in and then get two or three vendors, two or three uh, dealerships of some kind, um, it's pretty easy to come up with, with with quite a few dollars, even to pay for a meal. Um, you know, they'll all they'll all throw something in. It, it's just a great we, we just found it was a really good way to unite a community. You know, um, it, it's it's not just it's not just seed. It's not just chemical. It's not just, you know, conservation. It links all of those things, you know. Um, we've really never had from, from a from a 
conservation standpoint, we, we generally don't do a lot of things that involve industry. And so now we've got a, we've got a practice that, you know, wow, they get to sell, they get to sell a whole nother line of seed that they weren't selling before. So most of them are pretty excited to, to get in on that. One of our future uh, topics that we're considering doing is have some of the DCs uh, that have done these type of workshops do a presentation for us and, and share how they've put these workshops together and how they've built capacity of soil health. So I, I'm really hoping we can have our uh, field office people share us specifically how they've done that. So. Doug Adams posted a comment that I think is worth mentioning here. He says, as a farmer um, and SCT, I'd encourage staff to follow up with farmers. They have had attend soil health meetings, call, text, stop by and ask how things are working. Um, they will probably open up a conversation and that might lead to more down the road. So I think that's a really excellent comment on a lot of what you all are talking about here, you know, really following up with those innovative producers, following up with producers that are just getting started, following up with those that have expressed interest and, and maybe are getting started or maybe not and, and lending them a helping hand. Um, somewhat related to that though, an, another conversation, another uh, question that was submitted ahead of time was about mentors. Uh, you all have mentioned mentors that you've had as you have learned about soil health. And I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about how you got those mentors, how you might go about building your network. You know, if you're just getting started and you kind of feel like you're in it by yourselves, you don't really have that traction in your county yet. How do you start reaching out to the right folks so that you have the support you need to start leading, start partnering, start moving things forward in your county? Well, I talked a little bit about mentors in my talk and uh, uh, early on in my soil health career, Ray Archuleta, uh, Gabe Brown, Jay Fuhrer, uh, John Sticka, Steve Woodruff, uh, they were huge. I started reaching out to other state agronomists like Rudy Garcia, now just recently retired. Uh, they, they soon became my mentors and soon it blossomed as soon as I pushed a little effort to find those mentors. Uh, but a lot of them came from watching YouTube videos and reaching out to them uh, for, for help because that's one thing I really appreciated about the soil health movement is these guys are all out there to help you. And of course you get guys like Doug or Nathan, boy, those are some good guys to uh, reach out to for mentors and including all of our soil health division staff. They're they're really good. And I would like to say, you know, that's something that our staff really hopes to focus on. You know, as as you all start leading in your counties, please feel free to reach out to us. You know, uh, we are there to help mentor state area and field staff. Uh, however, that works best for the state. Um, different states work differently. So uh, be sure that uh, that everything is cleared within your state. Um, but we are there to support you at the state area and field level as needed. Um, we really want to help everybody get to a point where you can lead soil health uh, for yourselves in your state, in your county. Um, and so we're really uh, hoping to provide you some of that insight, um, some of the ways to get you going. Um, again, somewhat related um, in terms of getting going, a number of you mentioned demonstrations and there's a lot of demonstrations out there. Our division just put out a soil health toolbox that's available in the soil health POC teams under files, uh, under the publications. And that toolbox has in it a number of tools you might have uh, to help you do demonstrations. And there are also videos that are linked there. Um, so from, from a field office employee level, you know, where might you start? If you have never done any of these demos, if you're not quite comfortable getting in front of a crowd yet, you're just getting started. Um, how do you train yourself? Can you use that toolbox? Uh, where do you go next from there? Which demonstrations are the best ones to get started on and so on? Mm 
We got a question from Marika. I was going to send to Marlon. Uh, if you're in dry land wheat country, uh, a lot of the farmers are work, worried about lack of water and planting cover crops obviously is going to use some water. So talk, help, help share some strategies or some uh, uh, talking points for a planner out there in, in dry land country when, when we, they hear about these cover crops, but they're worried about them using water. Yeah, flat out, if there's no water after wheat harvest, you're not going to grow much, right? Uh, even though you got the sunshine, but you got to have the water. Uh, a lot of our guys in the western states have learned to integrate livestock into their operations. And so they've inserted full season cover crops in into the crop rotation to add that needed diversity, uh, supplemental grazing, reducing overall feed costs, which has been another huge uh, economic importance in the West is we've got a few guys now in the West that have reduced feed feeding of bale hay by 80% uh, in Wyoming. Uh, Jake, I forget his last name, uh, this year fed zero hay for the first time in his ranching career. Uh, but generally what they're doing is in, in, inputting, uh, inputting the full season cover crop right into the rotation. And, and grazing livestock if you have livestock on your operation. We've got a few guys that are starting to uh, do some interseeding, like put in a, a pound of turnips in their winter wheat, uh, excuse me, a pound of radish in their winter wheat, uh, or doing some interseeding uh, efforts. But yeah, if it's dry, the cover crop's not going to grow in August. Okay, staying with the cover crop theme. Uh, I'll, I'll throw this out there. There's a lot of folks that would like to be, um, this question's from an anonymous uh, person, but said they'd like to do with cover more with cover crop mixes, but the problem is uh, how do you come up with the right mix and, and without making it too expensive and, and making that mix, is, is it harder to plant and those kinds of things? And I guess I'd throw out right out of the gate, we all need to know the, the, the retailers in our area and the companies that are that are providing cover crop seed and work with them uh, in the background in the offside off off season months to when they're putting together mixes for the upcoming season uh, work with them make sure that what they're doing is is within your seeding standards and things like that so that they make sense and they're not so terribly expensive so that you know somebody new to this doesn't get get burned. Uh, by that, but I think I think it's a really good opportunity to work with our seed retail industry to come up with some really practical and logical mixes that work for our cropping systems in our areas. And I don't know anybody else want to talk about that a little bit, Doug. Doug, I know you've worked with some of those folks. Well, I mean, trying to figure out trying to figure out what species to. To, to plant that's probably one of the one of the toughest things there is you know because it depends on you know where you're at I mean just for example I, I work all the way from the boot hill of Missouri where we've got this huge growing season post harvest to, to northern Iowa <clears throat> which has a very very limited uh, growing season post harvest so <clears throat> you know saying that there's one particular way to do it all over the country that's pretty tough um, you just got to start looking at your resource concerns, what you're what you're trying to solve. You know, are you looking for livestock feed? Are you looking for for organic matter? Are you trying to solve some type of a compaction problem? Um, what's your what's your growing season opportunity? Is it is it after corn? Is it after corn? Uh, is it after soybeans? Um, is it after wheat? You know, you got to look at all the different options. Um, and that c cover crop species selection and, and knowing what cover crops do, um, that's probably the biggest the biggest uh, learning uh, that we have to do. You know, we have to understand those those different species, even even varieties within a particular species of cover crop have differences. Um, and so you you need to spend a lot of time. There's several good resources out there. Uh, managing cover crops profitably is a SARE book that's really good. Uh, Midwest Cover Crop Council has a really good tool um, to to help us try to select those mixtures. Um, there's other there's industry tools out there as well, but uh, 
that that's just got to be something you spend some time on, learn on. You know, Marlon Marlon made a great comment in in his talk. He said when he first started developing mixes, um, he submitted all of his mixes to somebody else and let them a more experienced person and let them review them and let them kind of pick up, pick it pick it apart a little bit. And I I did the same thing. You know, I sent it to a variety of people and said, hey, what about this one? And 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 so I think that's where you've got to start is is ask for some help uh, and then and then just start uh, trying to figure out what you're trying to solve. And just a quick plug in terms of tools, we are actively working with the cover crop councils. They are amazing partners because they bring together scientists from across universities, ARS, industry, farmers, NRCS. Uh, they bring all of those stakeholders together around really kind of vetting the newest science on cover crops. And so as Doug mentioned, the Midwest already has a great tool online. The Northeast will have a great tool online shortly. Uh, it's in the works for the next couple of months, maybe. Uh, Brandon, I think you know the timeline specifically off the top of your head. Um, and they're also working on one for the South and for the West, um, with the West being the one that will still take the longest. Uh, but those tools are coming and we are working on uh, bringing those tools in for NRCS use, working closely with them to make sure that those tools can give uh, give recommendations that meet NRCS specifications, can print out job sheets and the like. Um, and so while uh, right now a lot of us are still trying to figure that out, I think some of those questions will over time become a bit easier because there'll be a lot of expertise out there and there's a lot of coordination going on right now across our agencies, plant material centers, all of these different uh, entities that are out there uh, through that cover crop council effort. So uh, stay tuned, there will be more. Some other questions that I'm seeing come across. Yeah, my uh, switch gears I think now. this is an important one. Oh, sorry, Barry. Um, I, I see one oh, important problem. question here, which is a, a big part of doing something different is a social is the social considerations. So if anybody can share some tips on helping folks get past that, that would be really helpful. I think one of the things that helped help the farmers I work with is <clears throat> we try to surround ourselves with like-minded individuals. Uh, the neighbors generally know what everybody's doing uh, on their farms or ranches and and pretty soon they start congregating together because they are, have like-minded goals. So that's who I would push you towards is like-minded people in your community. I'll, I'll chime in too. Home. This, this is this is Barry. Um, involving, you know, a lot of universities in their ag department have rural sociologists, and uh, don't hesitate to bring some of those folks on board to some of your meetings too, because you know we can't just depend on the early adopters uh, all the time. We we're gonna at some point need to bring those middle adopters and the, the reason they're middle adopters is because they think differently, they're motivated differently and uh, uh, maybe a little more resistant to change unless they have really uh, uh, logical and practical reasons to, to make that change. So uh, understanding decision making and and what drives us is, uh, is, is really a important talent to understand and um, certainly we as an agency probably have, uh, have probably not taught as much on marketing skills and, and real sociology maybe as we once did, but might be something that we want to include in some of our workshops and trainings in the in the future. I know one of our CIG grants uh, for a, a researcher from from Purdue, Linda Propicky, has has uh, looked at uh, decision making uh, on conservation practices in general and has a really good some really good information. So maybe we'll try to get her on one of our science and technology webinars. Uh, offer that as a training. Thanks for submitting that, Neil. That's very important. 
the other thing that we're, we sh shift gears here just a little bit maybe is is uh, uh, you know it, it's a little agency like but uh, you know we've got all these resource concerns that are plugged into cart and plugged into our ranking process and some of those things and so uh, trying to talk about you know when Nathan was talking about infiltration and how infiltration is tied to soil erosion but we don't have an infiltration resource concern. Well, one thing that we have got is we've got two new resource concerns and we've up, upgraded uh, and updated the organic matter resource concern. So we've got aggregate stability is a new aggregate instability is a new resource concern. And so we've worked really hard with the national division uh, or uh, discipline leads and the, the folks working on car and we've got these these new resource concerns that do give the planner uh, a, a better opportunity to truly address the resource concerns that are at the root cause problems you know and so aggregate stability is a good example of of one of those new ones and then of course uh, habitat for soil organisms uh, you know that ties to soil function but we've also in updated uh, organic matter also and and we're talking about all pools now of, of organic matter and the reason we, we include all the pools of organic matter is because they have so much to do with uh, soil function you know organic matter is good but it's not a thing it's it's we're talking about all the fractions and all the pools of organic matter because they have so much to do with soil function so so sometime maybe that'll be a a, a good session to talk about is just just go through uh, you know, the resource concern list and which ones are tied together, which ones influence each other because resource concerns don't stand alone as a general rule or a lot of them do not. So anyway, I just thought I'd throw that out. That could be a whole session in and of itself, but since that was being talked and and, and a related question is where uh, we were talking about, you know, the, the, the soils division and all the, the area resource soil scientists and a lot of folks, soil scientists across the country are working on these dynamic soil properties and and talk and adding some layers for soil health in web soil survey. So all of this is really going to be important as we move forward and, and, and establish baselines for what are the soil capabilities. And you know, when we talk about dynamic soil properties, uh, the work that the data that they're gathering is going to be just really critical for us down the road and so we really encourage you if you're in a field office out there and you you're approached by one of the uh, soil scientists that are collecting these data really work with those because we really need we really need that data uh, integrated into our our soil survey so i just that's a shout out to those folks that are working on that and really appreciate their involvement Bianca, should we wrap up the meeting? I am looking at questions here to see if there's any others. We are past our time that we had originally allocated. I feel like we could keep going for a long time here. Um, I think that, yeah, we, we can get back to some folks on some of the additional questions here. Um, we will look through those questions for ideas on topics for the next conversations. I think what we've seen here today is there's a lot of questions out there. We could keep this conversation going. There's a lot to share. Um, we'd love to get some folks from the states on to give some presentations and be part of this conversation and answer questions. Um, we have had the idea pitched of having these as regional conversations so that we could get a little bit more into the nitty gritty of cropping systems that are particularly challenging for different regions so that's something that we could do um, we are completely open to your input on this if this was useful it's it seems already from from the comments we're getting that this has been useful to folks we would love to hear from you what you would like us to address next how we you'd like these to go if this format worked and those kinds of things so i'm going to close it out thank you very much for joining us today it's been really good to have you all on and we look forward to the next ones and we will be looking for feedback. There was a document linked from
the original invite. And so if you click on that link, it'll take you to a Word document. And please feel free to uh, send us a long bulleted list of topics that you would be interested in hearing about. So with that, I'm going to close this out. Thank you so much again for everybody. Um, we've been enjoying you joining us. And we will talk again in probably several weeks, a month or so. And we'll continue these. Thanks a lot. Take care, all.